Hey guys, Mr. Happy here and welcome to part two of my warrior job guide. We're going to continue from part one talking about all the remaining subjects we hadn't yet discussed. That includes cooldown management, useful macros, tanking advice, a tiny mention of main stat allocations, and one last paladin versus warrior segment. Now with that out of the way, let's go over cooldown management. Now this is one of the most important parts of warrior since they have a lot of cooldowns that they can use but most of them don't necessarily prevent damage. You have to use them at clever times to really get the most out of them. Now, we already spoke about Unchained and Infuriate in the Wrath section, so we'll leave those out for now. Additionally, we already spoke about Vengeance. All you need to know there is, outside of AoE tanking and it dealing a lot of damage, you can use it when uh, just when you're being hit randomly, like on Titan or something like that, and you can also use it to generate the extra stack of Wrath in the case where you don't have Infuriate available and you had to expend Inner Beast. So... Let's go over the real cooldown. So the first one is Bloodbath, which converts 25% of your physical damage to health. Ability is really not that great. It won't really save you if you need like healing now, though the increased healing is a nice gesture to your healers. It is technically best used during, during healing intensive parts of fights, such as stomps during Titan when your healers are busy dealing with everybody else. It does help to lend them that little bit of extra hand or when uh, AOV tanking a lot of mobs. It does come in handy that because overpower when it hits all the enemies, it will generate the healing for all of that damage you just did with the overpower. So it's really good in those situations. Now use it during those times to ensure you get the maximum effectiveness of it. If you're never going to use it, otherwise just pop it whenever you think you could use a little bit of extra healing just to help out. Now, the next one, Berserk. Great ability. It's probably your second best cooldown. Now, it increases your attack power, your total attack power by 50% for 20 seconds. In case you're wondering, that's the equivalent of having 50% more strength in this case. Attack power usually matches your strength. So think of it that way. Since it scales with your strength, it's almost like having 50% more strength. That is a lot. This plus maim, plus unchained, can make you a killing machine. It, it just let, it, it lets you do a couple things. One is it can let you generate massive amounts of enmity and healing even should you need it. I mean, you can use Berserk with Bloodbath to make its healing component even stronger, and you can use it with Inner Beast to make that healing component even stronger. As if it wasn't strong enough, 50% more damage, ugh, that's a lot. Well, 50% more attack power at least doesn't quite add up to the same thing, but you know what I mean. Now, hell, even Second Wind scales with attack power, so it actually boosts the effectiveness of that as well. So it's just a great ability overall. So, but the best Best time to use it really does vary, so clearly clearly, you'll want it available for DPS intensive phases like Titan's Heart. It's just great to have for phases like that. But remember that it's also a great enmity generating tool. You can use it at the start of single boss encounters to get a quick spike of enmity, especially against things like hard mode primals or even dreadnoughts in turn 4. Expect to lean more and more towards using it as a DPS cooldown though, as warrior's enmity generation is rarely a factor when if you are well geared enough. You'll usually generate enough without berserk. So just remember that after the 20 seconds of that buff of the boosted attack power, you become pacified for 5 seconds, meaning you can't use any of your weapon skills. You can still pop cooldowns, you just can't use abilities like Heavy Swing or Skull Sunder. You can't use any of those. A skilled healer can actually Asuna this off of you with that five second period, get it off right away, but it takes a very attentive healer for that to happen, so don't always count on it being a thing. Next is your best defensive cooldown, Thrill of Battle. Now this ability raises your max HP by 20% and it heals you for the same amount. Basically, it's a giant one-time heal. While it doesn't decrease the damage that you take in any way, shape, or form, like we discussed with Warrior, Warrior's more about surviving the damage and then healing back up, and you can use this for both of those things. It can give you the health to survive, or if you're in a tight situation, you can use it at low HP to give yourself a big heal while your healers catch up with you. Most of the time, you'll probably use it preemptively to make sure you survive the damage. It's just the more likely use for it. So think about it this way. Warrior with 7k HP uses it, now at 8.4k max HP for the duration, and they just heal for 1400. And think about it, it only gets more. It only becomes better as you get more gear. As you get more HP, it only gets better. But it is on a two minute cooldown, so don't, you know, it's not like, it. don't use it as a, as a crutch, like, oh, I need to think only about my HP of Thrill Battle. Make sure you're getting enough of your other stats as well as Vitality, so. And Unfortunately, immediately after talking about Thrill of Battle, we have to talk about your worst defensive cooldown as a warrior, Foresight. Now, Foresight increases your defense by 20%. 
on the surface, that seems pretty good. Unfortunately, in practice, it's been shown that, at least at this gear level, it's equivalent to about 5% physical mitigation increase. It's only defense, not magic defense. So it's effective, but it's not nearly as effective as the Paladin's Rampart. So keep this in mind, though. As the Warrior obtains more defense on their gear, this ability does become better. At some point, it may be equivalent to Rampart, but I'm hard-pressed to believe that, to be honest. Now... Another cooldown you have, and I use the term cooldown lightly here, is Mercy Stroke. Now, every 60 seconds, you can use Mercy Stroke once an enemy is below 20% HP. It's off the global cooldown, and it does a lot of damage. On top of that, if it lands the killing blow, it heals you for up to 20% of your max HP. This heal can be amazing if you can land it as the killing blow, which is the difficult part about it. Personally, I would think it would be great if Mercy Stroke placed a debuff on the target that if they died in the next five seconds that you got the heal, but we'll see what they do with it in patch 2.1. That's just another recommendation that I thought of after my other warrior upgrade uh, video. So now we have all the cooldowns spoken about, at least all the important ones. So let's talk about managing all these cooldowns we spoke of, and this is going to include abilities with the cross class cooldown we've already spoken about them these are going to be hard examples of when to use them not applicable in every single fight but it'll help you gauge when the most important times are to use the ability is now the easiest example for this is titan's mountain buster you should have a general cooldown rotation in your head prior to mountain buster so you can be prepared so Thrill of Battle is usually the best cooldown to pop for this sort of ability when, the very first time. And it sits on a two minute cooldown and you're gonna see why that's so important later on. Mountain Buster comes every 30 seconds, remember that. So you pop it right before Mountain Buster hits, you have the HP you need to survive the hit, bam. You've got one Mountain Buster out of the way. So next you're gonna have Foresight. And I, like I said, I know it's not great, but uh, Mountain Buster does is, one, is an attack that does deal uh, physical damage. It can be blocked, it can be parried, and it can be mitigated with physical defense, stone skin, and loquium, any of those fun things. So use Foresight for the next Mountain Buster, and like I said, as it deals physical damage, it should let you survive the attack. Now, all this time, ensure that you have your Wrath Stacks at 5. You don't want to be expending your Wrath Stacks at all during those first two Mountain Busters that you're absorbing. After you've burned both of these cooldowns, you're likely going to have to combine cooldowns to survive a big hit like Mountain Buster, just because it depends on how good your healers are and how good your gear is, but Warriors, you will get hit pretty hard since you don't have as many defensive cooldowns as a Paladin does. You also can only parry and not block, so you're a little bit less likely to go out of your way and parry these attacks. So. For the next one, prepare to pop Awareness and Inner Beast for the next Mountain Buster, ensuring you don't receive any critical auto attacks after the big hit. That is what Awareness is for. It's for ensuring after you take the big hit from Mountain Buster that you don't get critically hit by Titan's auto attack and killed. And believe me, it happens a lot. Now, inner, you, know, you have two times to use Inner Beast. You can either use it before Mountain Buster hits, if you're not at full HP, to ensure you get the full HP. Or you can use it immediately after Mountain Buster if you were at full HP just to get your HP pool back up to a higher number. So you have those two options to do when popping Inner Beast for a big hit like Mountain Buster. Now, pop in Fury and be prepared for the next Mountain Buster. Now, the next Mountain Buster, you will likely be expending Inner Beast again, though this time without Infuriate to immediately boost your Wrath Stacks back up. For this reason, you'll want to pop Convalescence prior to Mountain Buster hitting, then pop Inner Beast after you get hit. This will ensure that your healers can get you to full HP prior to Mountain Buster, so you're popping Convalescence before Mountain Buster even hits you. You want to make sure that you're getting enough healing. And then it lasts long enough so that even though you just expended Inner Beast and you have no Wrath Stacks, that Convalescence is still up and giving you time to get your Wrath Stacks back before it falls off so that you always have a healing buff on you of some sorts. This is also an excellent time to use Vengeance to give yourself a quick Wrath Stack off the global cooldown. By the time these four cycles complete, you should be able to rinse and repeat the cooldown rotation for every Mountain Buster going forward, starting right at the top of the list. So hopefully that was a good example. Now, I only use Mountain Buster as an example and understand that this is still an excellent rotation cooldown for other big hits. It also assumes your healers are not helping prepare you for big moves with a Loquium or Stone Skin or a Bubble or a Sacred Soil or anything along those lines, which on a Warrior Tank helps immensely during these types of rotations. So as for offensive cooldowns, use them as you best see fit. Just be sure that the times you pop them are appropriate. For example, in turn two, 
Tanks are constantly trading enmity between each other. To do this, it's usually safe to not hit the boss and generate enmity after the other tank provokes. So the other tank provokes, you stop hitting the boss just because of the way provoke works. And again, we will talk about that in a little bit. That makes using an offensive cooldown around that time fairly meaningless. So using them right before you're about to be tanking, on the other hand, can prove quite useful. However, ensure that should you need to provoke off the other tank, that you won't get hit by that five second pacification from Berserk. It won't prevent you from using provoke, but provoke is only really good when you use an ability immediately after it, such as Butcher's Block, to really pop your enmity up above the other tank. So just make sure that the five second timer isn't going to coincide with when you need to actually provoke the boss. Now, you're probably wondering, why haven't we mentioned Home Gang? Mostly because, it doesn't have any good uses. I mean, there are a few possible uses. I think one of the only possible uses is in Wanderer's Palace against the to hold the Pudding Boss still when he locks on to somebody. That's one of the only uses I can actually think of. Or potentially even in turn 5 to potentially lock down the Dread Knight. I haven't tested that, but Home Gang is its own buff. It's not a traditional bind. It's actually the Home Gang debuff. So it actually may work. However... It's on a 3 minute cooldown, so that's not really that reliable. I expect it to be more of a PvP ability. Now, before we move on to tank advice, I do want to quickly talk about macro usage for warriors. Now, there are actually a handful of useful macros that you can use here. The first one, and this is my favorite by the way, is the Berserk macro. A handy note about the pacification effect after Berserk wears off is that it can actually be Asunad. This macro attempts to let your healers know that you will need to Asuna soon. So this macro, the first line is the line for using Berserk. It will activate it. Next line makes the macro wait 15 seconds before it does its next command. And the last one uh, says to your party that the pacification is ending soon, that, the, that you will be pacified soon, excuse me, and that you, can, that you would like an Asuna in the next five seconds. This will let your healers know that they can Asuna you so you aren't made unable to use weapon skills for that short time. This does require extremely attentive healers to make active use of, though. Another potential macro is to add Infuriate after Inner Beast, Unchained, or Steel Cyclone. This is done simply by adding two lines to a macro with any of these abilities on it. For example, the first line, Inner Beast on your target. There you go. Next line, slash wait one, will wait one second. And then the last line will use Infuriate on yourself. This will automatically use Infuriate should you have just expended Inner Beast, assuming that uh, Infuriate is available. Now, other than that, and the standard marking of targets, there really isn't much to go with for, uh, for macros here. But those two macros can be quite useful. Just remember that if you use the Inner Beast macro while the Berserk macro is ticking, that you will cancel out the Berserk macro. Also, spam pressing the macros is just a bad idea. These are really press them once and use them kind of macros. Now, just for the last bit of tanking advice, uh, this is really just going to be the last bit of the video. First is, as a warrior, always assume your party is going to ignore your focus target, even if you mark it. Just assume that. For that reason, be ready to use flash and overpower on most every pull you do when in a dungeon. If there are more than one mob, just be ready to use it. So, still mark the targets like a responsible tank, but be prepared to AoE quite a bit. Now, if you have a black mage that's sleeping mobs, be sure not to use overpower and wake them up. Just use flash a few times for when they do wake up so they don't go right for the black mage or right for the healer. The next bit of advice is with Provoke. Now, I said we were talking about this a little bit later before, and that now is that time. So this is a tip for new tanks who may not yet understand this ability's use. As the tooltip is not made entirely clear. So Provoke works like this. It looks at the enmity of your entire party when you use it. Now, even though you can't see it, everybody in your party has a flat number of enmity that they have related to them at the given time. It finds a member with the highest amount of enmity and brings you exactly to that amount. So if a healer had 3,500 enmity and you had zero, you now have 3,500 enmity. It then adds one over that person. So you now have actually 3,500 and one enmity, making you the highest enmity target. This means that, for example, if you're the highest enmity target at 2,000 enmity, let's say you are the highest enmity target at 2,000 enmity. After provoke, it will look at the whole party, see that you have the highest enmity, and simply add one enmity, and you now have 2,000 and one enmity. Basically, it's best to use if the boss or if the boss is going for another target or if maybe the other tank or the other party member. So uh, look at it this way: trade tanking between the same target is also a great use for it. After using provoke, though, 
you'll immediately want to hit the enemy as hard as possible. So having an ability like Butcher's Block preloaded after Provoke helps ensure that you hold aggro on the target very, very well. Additionally, should someone be provoking off of you, you should stop using abilities altogether right when they're about to provoke. Now, last bit of advice, always eat food. Some decent foods are F-Steaks or Lenotion Toast. F-Steak is good if you're trying to go for more for, for more of a skill speed build, and it works really well with your kit for getting rat stacks back up after expending them and generating faster enmity. Lenotion Toast works really well for parry and accuracy on the other hand, which are just raw tanking stats. F-Steak has slightly more VIT, but it's only a single point, so it's not that big of a deal. So make sure you're doing all those things. Now, with that in mind, I do quickly want to talk about Strength Warriors versus Vitality Warriors. Both are incredibly viable right now. I personally prefer Strength Warriors over Vitality Warriors, assuming you have the gear to back it up. You do need to have enough HP to survive certain hits, and if you don't, you quite simply can't go a Strength Warrior. You also need far more attentive healers as a Strength Warrior, just because big hits from from enemies such as a Dreadnought in turn 4, Twintania in turn 5, Mountain Busters from Titan, they will bring you a lot closer to death and that tends to raise a panic issue in healers. A lot of healers get really nervous and they think that the warrior is a bad tank when something like that happens. It's not the case at all. Warriors just don't deal with damage quite the same way. I hope to see some good changes in patch 2.1 with the warrior because just the way that warrior versus paladin works right now, it doesn't really... It doesn't really play well with the fights we have now because paladins scale differently than warriors. Paladins scale off the enemies that are hitting them. So the harder an enemy hits them, the more effective that a 20% damage reduction is, or blocking, or parrying, or, uh, or being invincible. The harder an enemy hits, the more useful that those tools are. With a warrior, the warrior scales with themselves. The, everything they do is dependent on their own HP, their own damage, their own gear. It's all dependent on everything that's part of them. They cannot do anything to adjust to different enemies. They just have to be true to themselves. So for that reason, I hope we see warrior able to scale a little bit better with the enemy in upcoming patches. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. I th I think I'm going to make this a three-parter. If I do, I will make sure to do an, an outro for every single one of them. We're at 33 minutes of recording right now, so I don't expect anybody to watch that all in one sitting. But anyway, guys, thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, favorite, subscribe, and share for more Final Fantasy XIV information and videos and guides, of course. Also, be sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you can ask me questions there. I, I have no problem reaching out to you guys. If you reach out to me, I'll do my best to reach out back to you. Also, you can follow me on Twitch. I do stream on Sundays and Wednesdays. There's a schedule on my Twitch. I will also be streaming for charity throughout the month of November 2013 for the Extra Life Charity Fundraiser. Thank you so much for anyone who supported it so far, and hopefully I'll see you guys on the stream come stream schedule time. So anyway, guys, thank you for watching. Until next time, take care.